Hello, friends. I'm Ellie. Welcome to Cardboard Design. <gasps> Today, let's listen to the meaningful fairy tales I'm about to tell. I hope you'll like it. First fairy tale. The poor miller's boy and the cat. In a certain mill lived an old miller who had neither wife nor child, and three apprentices wow. served under him. As they had been with him several years, he one day said to them, I am old and want to sit in the chimney corner. Go out, and whichsoever of you brings me the best horse home to him will I give the mill, and in return for it he shall take care of me till my death. The third of the boys was, however, the drudge, who was looked on as foolish by the others. They begrudged the mill to him, and afterwards he would not have it. Then all three went out together, and when they came to the village, the two said to stupid Hans, Thou mayst just as well stay here, as long as thou livest thou wilt never get a horse. Hans, however, went with them, and when it was night they came to a cave in which they lay down to sleep. The two sharp ones waited until Hans had fallen asleep, then they got up, and went away leaving him where he was. And they thought they had done a very clever thing, but it was certain to turn out ill for them. When the sun arose, and Hans woke up, he was lying in a deep cavern. He looked around on every side and exclaimed, Oh, heavens, where am I? Then he got up and clambered out of the cave, went into the forest, and thought, Here I am quite alone and deserted. How shall I obtain a horse now? Whilst he was thus walking full of thought, he met a small tabby cat which said quite kindly, Hans, where are you going? Alas, thou canst not help me. I will know your desire, said the cat. You wish to have a beautiful horse. Come with me and be my faithful servant for seven years long, and then I will give you one more beautiful than any you have ever seen in your whole life. Well, this is a wonderful cat, thought Hans. But I am determined to see if she is telling the truth. So she took him with her into her enchanted castle, where there were nothing but cats who were her servants. They leapt nimbly upstairs and downstairs, and were merry and happy. In the evening when they sat down to dinner, three of them had to make music. One played the bassoon, the other the fiddle, and the third put the trumpet to his lips, and blew out his cheeks as much as he possibly could. When they had dined, the table was carried away, and the cat said, Now, Hans, come and dance with me. No, said he. I won't dance with a pussy cat. I have never done that yet. Then take him to bed, said she to the cat. So one of them lighted him to his bedroom, one pulled his shoes off, one his stockings, and at last one of them blew out the candle. Next morning they returned and helped him out of bed. One put his stockings on for him, one tied his garters, one brought his shoes, one washed him, and one dried his face with her tail. That feels very soft, said Hans. He, however, had to serve the cat and chop some wood every day, and to do that, he had an axe of silver and the wedge and sawer of silver and the mallet of copper. So he chopped the wood small, stayed there in the house and had good meat and drink, but never saw anyone but the tabby cat and her servant. Once she said to him, Go and mow my meadow and dry the grass. And gave him a sip of silver and a whetstone of gold, but bade him deliver them up again carefully. So Hans went thither and did what he was bidden. And when he had finished the work, he carried the sith, whetstone, and hay to the house, and asked if it was not yet time for her to give him his reward. No! said the cat. You must first do something more for me of the same kind. There is timber, silver, carpenter's axe, square, and everything that is needful, all of silver, with these build me a small house. Then Hans built the small house, and said that he had now done everything, and still he had no horse. Nevertheless, the seven years had gone by with him as if they were six months. The cat asked him if he would like to see her horses. Yes, said Hans. Then she opened the door of a small house, and when she had opened it, there stood twelve horses, such horses, so bright and shining, that his heart rejoiced at the sight of them. And now she gave him to eat and drink, and said, Go home, I will not give thee thy horse away with thee, but in three days' time I will follow thee and bring it. So Hans set out, and she showed him the way to the mill. She had, however, never once given him a new coat, and he had been obliged to keep on his dirty old smock frock, which he had brought with him, and which during the seven years had everywhere become too small for him. When he reached home, 
The two other apprentices were there again as well, and each of them certainly had brought a horse with him, but one of them was a blind one, and the other lame. They asked Hans where his horse was. It will follow me in three days' time. Then they laughed and said, Indeed, stupid Hans, where wilt thou get a horse? It will be a fine one. Hans went into the parlor, but the miller said he should not sit down to table, for he was so ragged and torn that they would all be ashamed of him if anyone came in. So they gave him a mouthful of food outside, and at night, when they went to rest, the two others would not let him have a bed, and at last he was forced to creep into the goose house and lie down on a little hard straw. In the morning when he awoke, the three days had passed, and a coach came with six horses and they shone so bright that it was delightful to see them. And a servant brought a seventh as well, which was for the poor miller's boy. And a magnificent princess alighted from the coach and went into the mill, and this princess was the little tabby cat whom poor Hans had served for seven years. She asked the miller where the miller's boy and drudge was. Then the miller said, We cannot have him here in the mill, for he is so ragged. He is lying in the goose house. Then the king's daughter said that they were to bring him immediately. So they brought him out, and he had to hold his little smock frock together to cover himself. The servants unpacked splendid garments, and washed him and dressed him. And when that was done, no king could have looked more handsome. Then the maiden desired to see the horses which the other apprentices had brought home with them, and one of them was blind and the other lame. So she ordered the servant to bring the seventh horse, and when the miller saw it, he said that such a horse as that had never yet entered his yard. And that is for the third miller's boy? Said she. Then he must have the mill? Said the miller. But the king's daughter said that the horse was there, and that he was to keep his mill as well, and took her faithful hunts and set him in the coach, and drove away with him. They first drove to the little house which he had built with the silver tools, and behold it was a great castle, and everything inside it was of silver and gold, and then she married him, and he was rich, so rich that he had enough for all the rest of his life. After this, let no one ever say that anyone who is silly can never become a person of importance. Hans, despite being considered foolish, is the only one who helps the cat when she needs it. In the story, Hans's compassion is rewarded when the cat transforms into a princess and fulfills her promise. Hans does not blame or get angry when left in the cave, and he patiently carries out all the tasks the cat requests. His virtue and patience are ultimately rewarded when he receives a well-deserved reward. Despite being perceived as foolish, Hans does not shy away from challenges. He demonstrates innovation and flexibility in approaching problems, such as building a house using silver tools. This enables him to achieve his goals and surpass expectations in the end. Second Fairy Tale The Golden Goose There was a man who had three sons, the youngest of whom was called the Simpleton, and was despised, laughed at, and neglected on every occasion. It happened one day that the eldest son wished to go into the forest to cut wood, and before he went his mother gave him a delicious pancake and a flask of wine, that he might not suffer from hunger or thirst. When he came into the forest the little old grey man met him, who wished him good day, and said, Give me a bit of cake out of your pocket, and let me have a drink of your wine. I am so hungry and thirsty. But the prudent youth answered, Give you my cake and my wine. I haven't got any be off with you. And leaving the little man standing there, he went off. Then he began to fell a tree, but he had not been at it long before he made a wrong stroke, and the hatchet hit him in the arm, so that he was obliged to go home and get it found up. That was what came of the little grey man. Afterwards, the second son went into the wood, and the mother gave to him, as to the eldest, a pancake and a flask of wine. The little old grey man met him also, and begged for a little bit of cake and a drink of wine. But the second son spoke out plainly, saying, what I give you I lose myself, so be up with you. And leaving the little man standing there, he went off. The punishment followed, as he was chopping away at the tree, he hit himself in the leg so severely that he had to be carried home. Then said the simpleton, Father, let me go for once into the forest to cut wood. <laughs> and the father answered, Your brothers have hurt themselves by so doing, give it up. 
You understand nothing about it? But the simpleton went on begging so long, that the father said at last, Well, be off with you. You will only learn by experience. The mother gave him a cake. It was only made with water and baked in the ashes, and with it a flask of sour beer. When he came into the forest, the little old gray man met him, and greeted him, saying, Give me a bit of your cake, and a drink from your flask. I am so hungry and thirsty. And the simpleton answered, I have only a flour and water cake and sour beer, but if that is good enough for you, let us sit down together and eat. Then they sat down, and as the simpleton took out his flour and water cake it became a rich pancake, and his sour beer became good wine. Then they ate and drank, and afterwards the little man said, As you have such a kind heart, and share what you have so willingly, I will bestow good luck upon you. Yonder stands an old tree, cut it down, and at its roots you will find something. And thereupon the little man took his departure. The simpleton went there, and hewed away at the tree, and when it fell he saw, sitting among the roots, a goose with feathers of pure gold. He lifted it out and took it with him to an inn where he intended to stay the night. The landlord had three daughters who, when they saw the goose, were curious to know what wonderful kind of bird it was, and ended by longing for one of its golden feathers. The eldest thought, I will wait for a good opportunity, and then I will pull out one of its feathers for myself. And so, when the simpleton was gone out, she seized the goose by its wing, but there her finger and hand had to stay, held fast. Soon after came the second sister with the same idea of plucking out one of the golden feathers for herself, but scarcely had she touched her sister. Then she also was obliged to stay, held fast. Lastly came the third with the same intention, but the others screamed out. Stay away! For heaven's sake, stay away! But she did not see why she should stay away, and thought, If they do so, why should not I? And went towards them. But when she reached her sisters, there she stopped, hanging on with them. And so they had to stay, all night. The next morning the simpleton took the goose under his arm and went away, unmindful of the three girls that hung on to it. The three had always to run after him, left and right, wherever his legs carried him. In the midst of the fields they met the parson, who, when he saw the procession, said, Shame on you girls, running after a young fellow through the fields like this. And forthwith he seized hold of the youngest by the hand to drag her away, but hardly had he touched her when he too was obliged to run after them himself. Not long after the sexton came that way, and seeing the respected parson following at the heels of the three girls, he called out, Oh, your reverence, wither away so quickly? You forget that we have another christening today. And he seized hold of him by his gown, but no sooner had he touched him than he was obliged to follow on two. As the five tramped on, one after another, two peasants with their hoes came up from the fields, and the parson cried out to them, and begged them to come and set him and the sexton free. But no sooner had they touched the sexton than they had to follow on two, and now there were seven following the simpleton and the goose. By and by they came to a town where a king reigned, who had an only daughter who was so serious that no one could make her laugh. Therefore the king had given out that whoever should make her laugh should have her in marriage. The simpleton, when he heard this, went with his goose and his hangers on into the presence of the king's daughter, and as soon as she saw the seven people following always one after the other, she burst out laughing, and seemed as if she could never stop. And so the simpleton earned a right to her as his bride, but the king did not like him for son-in-law and made all kinds of objections, and said he must first bring a man who could drink up a whole cellar of wine. The simpleton thought that the little gray man would be able to help him, and went out into the forest, and there, on the very spot where he fell the tree, he saw a man sitting with a very sad countenance. The simpleton asked him what was the matter, and he answered, I have a great thirst, which I cannot quench, cold water does not agree with me, I have indeed drunk up a whole cask of wine, but what good is a drop like that? Then said the simpleton, I can help you, only come with me, and you shall have enough. He took him straight to the king's cellar, and the man sat himself down before the big vats, 
and drank, and drank, and before a day was over he had drunk up the whole cellar full. The simpleton again asked for his bride, but the king was annoyed that a wretched fellow, called the simpleton by everybody, should carry off his daughter, and so he made new conditions. He was to produce a man who could eat up a mountain of bread. The simpleton did not hesitate long, but ran quickly off to the forest, and there in the same place sat a man who had fastened a strap round his body, making a very piteous face, and saying, I have eaten a whole bakehouse full of rolls, but what is the use of that when one is so hungry as I am? My stomach feels quite empty, and I am obliged to strap myself together, that I may not die of hunger. The simpleton was quite glad of this, and said, Get up quickly, and come along with me, and you shall have enough to eat. He led him straight to the king's courtyard where all the meal in the kingdom had been collected and baked into a mountain of bread. The man out of the forest settled himself down before it and hastened to eat, and in one day the whole mountain had disappeared. Then the simpleton asked for his bride the third time. The king, however, found one more excuse, and said he must have a ship that should be able to sail on land or on water. The king, however, found one more excuse and said he must have a ship that should be able to sail on land or on water. So soon, said he, as you come sailing along with it, you shall have my daughter for your wife. The simpleton went straight to the forest, and there sat the little old gray man with whom he had shared his cake, and he said, I have eaten for you, and I have drunk for you. I will also give you the ship. And all because you were kind to me at the first. Then he gave him the ship that could sail on land and on water. And when the king saw it, he knew he could no longer withhold his daughter. The marriage took place immediately. And at the death of the king, the simpleton possessed the kingdom and lived long and happily with his wife. Despite being despised and labeled as a simpleton, the main character possesses a compassionate heart and is willing to help others. He shares his cake and beer with the little gray man, and through this act of kindness, he receives assistance and good fortune. Faced with challenging situations, the main character never gives up and maintains a positive and optimistic attitude. He willingly experiments and confronts difficulties to achieve his goals. Although the main character may not appear conventionally intelligent, through experiences and challenges, he learns valuable lessons. The ability to confront challenges and learn from mistakes is crucial for personal development and success in life. Third Fairy Tale Rumpelstiltskin There was once a miller who was poor, but he had one beautiful daughter. It happened one day that he came to speak with the king, and to give himself consequence, he told him that he had a daughter who could spin gold out of straw. The king said to the miller, that is an art that pleases me well. If thy daughter is as clever as you say, bring her to my castle tomorrow, that I may put her to the proof. When the girl was brought to him, he led her into a room that was quite full of straw, and gave her a wheel and spindle, and said, Now set to work, and if by the early morning thou hast not spun this straw to gold, thou shalt die. And he shut the door himself, and left her there alone. And so the poor miller's daughter was left there sitting, and could not think what to do for her life. She had no notion how to set to work to spin gold from straw, and her distress grew so great that she began to weep. Then all at once the door opened, and in came a little man, who said, Good evening, miller's daughter, why are you crying? Oh, answered the girl, I have got to spin gold out of straw? And I don't understand the business. Then the little man said, What will you give me if I spin it for you? My necklace, said the girl. The little man took the necklace, seated himself before the wheel, and whir, whir, whir. Three times round and the bobbin was full, then he took up another, and whir, whir, whir. Three times round, and that was full, and so he went until the morning, when all the straw had been spun, and all the bobbins were full of gold. At sunrise came the king, and when he saw the gold he was astonished and very much rejoiced, for he was very avaricious. He had the miller's daughter taken into another room filled with straw, much bigger than the last, and told her that as she valued her life she must spin it all in one night. 
The girl did not know what to do, so she began to cry. And then the door opened, and the little man appeared and said, What will you give me if I spin all this straw into gold? The ring from my finger, answered the girl. So the little man took the ring, and began again to send the wheel whirring round, and by the next morning all the straw was spun into glistening gold. The king was rejoiced beyond measure at the sight, but as he could never have enough of gold, he had the miller's daughter taken into a still larger room full of straw and said, This too must be spun in one night, and if you accomplish it, you shall be my wife. For he thought, Although she is but a miller's daughter, I am not likely to find anyone richer in the whole world. As soon as the girl was left alone, the little man appeared for the third time and said, What will you give me if I spin the straw for you this time? I have nothing left to give, answered the girl. Then you must promise me the first child you have after you are queen, said the little man. But who knows whether that will happen, thought the girl. But as she did not know what else to do in her necessity, she promised the little man what he desired, upon which he began to spin, until all the straw was gold. And when in the morning the king came and found all done according to his wish, he caused the wedding to be held at once, and the miller's pretty daughter became a queen. In a year's time she brought a fine child into the world, and thought no more of the little man, but one day, he came suddenly into her room, and said, Now give me what you promised me. The queen was terrified greatly, and offered the little man all the riches of the kingdom if he would only leave the child, but the little man said, No, I would rather have something living than all the treasures of the world. Then the queen began to lament and to weep, so that the little man had pity upon her. I will give you three days said he. And if at the end of that time you cannot tell my name, you must give up the child to me. Then the queen spent the whole night in thinking over all the names that she had ever heard, and sent a messenger through the land to ask far and wide for all the names that could be found. And when the little man came next day, beginning with Casper, male cheer Balthazar, she repeated all she knew, and went through the whole list, but after each the little man said, That is not my name! The second day, the queen sent to inquire of all the neighbors what the servants were called, and told the little man all the most unusual and singular names, saying, Perhaps you are called roast ribs, or sheep shanks, or spindle shanks? But he answered nothing but, That is not my name! The third day, the messenger came back again, and said, I have not been able to find one single new name, but as I passed through the woods I came to a high hill, and near it was a little house, and before the house burned a fire, and round the fire danced a comical little man, and he hopped on one leg and cried, Today do I bake, tomorrow I brew, the day after that the queen's child comes in, and oh, I am glad that nobody knew, that the name I am called is Rumpelstiltskin. You cannot think how pleased the queen was to hear that name, and soon afterwards, when the little man walked in and said, Now, missus! Queen, what is my name? She said at first. Are you called Jack? No! Answered he. Are you called Harry? She asked again. No! Answered he. And then she said. Then perhaps your name is Rumpelstiltskin? The devil told you that! The devil told you that! Cried the little man. And in his anger he stamped with his right foot so hard that it went into the ground above his knee. Then he seized his left foot with both his hands in such a fury that he split in two, and there was an end of him. In the story, the king promises to marry the girl if she can turn straw into gold. This is an impossible request, but the king made the promise without careful consideration. The lesson here is to ensure that we do not promise something that is impossible. The girl in the story faces a difficult situation when the king demands her to do the impossible. However, when she cannot solve the problem, she has to accept the consequences. The lesson here is that people need to keep their promises and face their personal responsibilities. The main character in the story is Rumpelstiltskin, a little wizard with the ability to turn straw into gold. He helps the girl solve the problem but requests her to keep his name a secret. When the secret is revealed, Rumpelstiltskin disappears. The lesson here is that sometimes keeping a secret can avoid unwanted consequences.
The fourth fairy tale, The Three Feathers. There was once on a time a king who had three sons, of whom two were clever and wise, but the third did not speak much, and was simple, and was called the simpleton. When the king had become old and weak, and was thinking of his end, he did not know which of his sons should inherit the kingdom after him. Then he said to them, Go forth, and he who brings me the most beautiful carpet shall be king after my death. And that there should be no dispute amongst them. He took them outside his castle, blew three feathers in the air, and said, You shall go as they fly. One feather flew to the east, the other to the west, but the third flew straight up and did not fly far, but soon fell to the ground. And now one brother went to the right, and the other to the left, and they mocked Simpleton, who was forced to stay where the third feather had fallen. He sat down and was sad, then all at once he saw that there was a trap door close by the feather, he raised it up, found some steps, and went down them, and then he came to another door, knocked at it, and heard somebody inside calling, Little green maiden small, hopping, hopping hither and thither, hop to the door, and quickly see who is there. The door opened, and he saw a great, fat toad sitting, and round about her a crowd of little toads. The fat toad asked what he wanted, he answered, I should like to have the prettiest and finest carpet in the world. Then she called a young one and said, Little green maiden small, hopping, hopping hither and thither, hop quickly and bring me, the great box here. The young toad brought the box, and the fat toad opened it, and gave Simpleton a carpet out of it, so beautiful and so fine, that on the earth above, none could have been woven like it. Then he thanked her, and ascended again. The two others had, however, looked on their youngest brother as so stupid that they believed he would find and bring nothing at all. Why should we give ourselves a great deal of trouble to search? Said they, and got some coarse handkerchiefs from the first shepherd's wives whom they met, and carried them home to the king. At the same time Simpleton also came back, and brought his beautiful carpet, and when the king saw it he was astonished, and said, If justice be done, the kingdom belongs to the youngest. But the two others let their father have no peace, and said that it was impossible that Simpleton, who in everything lacked understanding, should be king, and entreated him to make a new agreement with them. Then the father said, He who brings me the most beautiful ring shall inherit the kingdom, and led the three brothers out, and blew into the air three feathers, which they were to follow. Those of the two eldest again went east and west, and Simpleton's feather flew straight up, and fell down near the door into the earth. Then he went down again to the fat toad, and told her that he wanted the most beautiful ring. She at once ordered her great box to be brought, and gave him a ring out of it, which sparkled with jewels, and was so beautiful that no goldsmith on earth would have been able to make it. The two eldest laughed at Simpleton for going to seek a golden ring. They gave themselves no trouble, but knocked the nails out of an old carriage ring, and took it to the king. But when Simpleton produced his golden ring, his father again said, The kingdom belongs to him. The two eldest did not cease from tormenting the king until he made a third condition and declared that the one who brought the most beautiful woman home should have the kingdom. He again blew the three feathers into the air, and they flew as before. Then Simpleton without more ado went down to the fat toad and said, I am to take home the most beautiful woman. Oh! Answered the toad. The most beautiful woman. She is not at hand at the moment, but still thou shalt have her. She gave him a yellow turnip which had been hollowed out to which six mice were harnessed. Then Simpleton said quite mournfully, What am I to do with that? The toad answered, Just put one of my little toads into it. Then he seized one at random out of a circle and put her into the yellow coach, but hardly was she seated inside it then she turned into a wonderfully beautiful maiden and the turnip into a coach and the six mice into horses. So he kissed her and drove off quickly with the horses and took her to the king. His brothers came afterwards. They had given themselves no trouble at all to seek beautiful girls, but had brought with them the first peasant women they chanced to meet. When the king saw them, he said, After my death, the kingdom belongs to my youngest son. But the two eldest deafened the king's ears afresh with their clamor. We cannot consent to Simpleton's being king. And demanded that the one whose wife could leap through a ring which hung in the center of the hall should have the preference. They thought, the peasant women can do that easily. They are strong enough. 
but the delicate maiden will jump herself to death. The age king agreed likewise to this. Then the two peasant women jumped and jumped through the ring, but were so stout that they fell and their coarse arms and legs broke in two. And then the pretty maiden whom Simpleton had brought with him sprang and sprang through as lightly as a deer and all opposition had to cease. So he received the crown and has ruled wisely for a length of time. The tale emphasizes the idea that acts of kindness and generosity are rewarded in the end. Simpleton's willingness to help the old man results in him receiving magical items that aid him in overcoming the challenges set by the king. This teaches the lesson that selfless actions can lead to positive outcomes. The elder brothers in the story are portrayed as ambitious and arrogant, believing that success is guaranteed based on their self-perceived superiority. However, it is Simpleton, often underestimated and labeled as foolish, who succeeds in the challenges. The story conveys the message that humility and simplicity can lead to success, while arrogance may lead to downfall. The magical elements in the story, such as the seemingly ordinary tablecloth, the goose that lays golden eggs, and the princess in disguise, highlight the theme that appearances can be deceptive. The story encourages readers to look beyond surface-level judgments and recognize the potential and value hidden within seemingly ordinary or unremarkable things or individuals. This is the end of the story, did you like it? See you tomorrow to hear other interesting fairy tales. Bye-bye!